There are two men, and they're having a big argument. They're having a really big argument in a marketplace. And they're just shouting at each other, and it's getting really intense, and they're just yelling at each other, just furious with each other. There's a young boy watching, and he turns to his father and he says, you know, they're yelling at each other, and they've just been yelling at each other intensely and having this intense argument for so long. He says, why doesn't one man punch the other man? Why doesn't one man hit the other man? And the, uh, the, the father says to the young boy, he says, because the man who throws the first punch will be admitting that the other man's arguments were correct, right? <laughs> and I want to dedicate this beautiful story about what it means to invoke and engage in violence, what it means to shut down your opponent, what it means to escalate things to force. I want to dedicate that to the New York City Police Department. <laughs> because when people came out here and Occupy Wall Street, when people came out here to peacefully demonstrate and demand some accountability for the financial crisis, to demand some accountability from the big banks and corporations that have looted communities throughout this country, they responded with heavy repression. And in doing so, they were admitting that we were right. Go. And if you, look, if you look at the United States right now, people know overwhelmingly that we were right. As people are looking at the opioid epidemic and how so many lives have been taken because big pharma corporations push doctors to overprescribe opioid medications, people realize that we were right. When we look at the prison industrial complex and the mass rebellion going on against police brutality as people take to the streets and demand accountability from law enforcement and an end to the prison industrial complex, people realize that we were right. Right now, as polls come out showing that 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. public has a positive view of socialism and a negative view of capitalism, people know that we were right. People know that we were right. People realize that these big banks and these corporations and these ultra-monopolies that have dominated not just the economy of the United States, but the economy of the world, they're not benefiting us. They're not working in the interests of humanity. They're not unleashing us to be the beautiful creatures we are, the inventors, the innovators. Instead, they are bringing out the worst in us. They are creating a culture of selfishness, a culture of greed, a culture of hate, a culture of destruction. They are grinding countries into poverty, and they're creating a world where money comes first and human, ne human needs are left behind. That is the reality of what Wall Street is offering us. But now, there is an awakening around the world. People realize that this global system of monopoly capitalism, this system of imperialism centered around big banks and corporations based here on Wall Street or in London, this system isn't benefiting people around the world. The question now is, what are we going to do about it? How is this going to change? What is going to be done? How are we going to demand that our elected officials actually take action? You know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president of the United States, he used to talk about do-nothing government. Government that sits on its hands and lets the country fall to shreds. Well, I look at the United States right now, with 27 different states unpaving the roads, with water that's not properly purified, uh, with so many communities devastated, with wages dropping, with gentrification and the rising costs of housing. And I would say that the government of the United States is in complete dereliction of duty. Complete dereliction yes. of duty. Woo. And this idea that we've been told that we shouldn't, we shouldn't have the government take action. The government has no obligation or no responsibility to us needs to be gotten real, rid of. We need the government to step in. We need state and popular power to step in and fight for working families. I've raised the slogan many times, we need a government of action that will fight for working families. It is time, it is time for the leaders of the United States to revive the tradition of statecraft. It's time for them to not be in dereliction of duty anymore. It's time for strong leadership that will stand up to Wall Street, not grovel before it and beg for more campaign contributions, but stand up to Wall Street, stand up to the corporations, stand up to the big banks, and demand justice. And you know, Occupy Wall Street was a long time ago, 10 years ago, and while we want to praise the amazing bravery that we saw in the streets, we want to praise the amazing things that were done, we can also be critical. There were mistakes that we made. I really wish that we had done more to protest the bombing of Libya and the fact that while we were out here, the most prosperous country on the African continent,
continent was being bombed and destroyed so that Wall Street could sink its fangs into, into Libya again. We should have done more to stand in solidarity with the people of Libya against the NATO bombing campaign. Yes. Yes. We shouldn't have let the regime change lobby and the folks that, that try to destabilize countries and spread chaos, we shouldn't have let them infiltrate us the way they did. We shouldn't have let them hijack our message to serve imperialism. That was a mistake. But I want to tell you the most brave thing that I saw, one of the most exciting things that I saw in Occupy, was there were so many people from across the country. I mean, I'm from Ohio. There were people from, from Texas. There were people from Idaho. There were people from Hawaii. There were people from all over the country. Young folks who didn't have a job were struggling to get by, struggling to pay their student debts, struggling to, to feed themselves, struggling to try and get the dignity of adulthood in this economy that doesn't seem to have a place for the next generation of workers. And so many of them said, you know what, I am going to leave, I'm going to leave my old life behind, I'm going to get on a Greyhound bus, I'm going to get on an airplane, I'm going to get on a train, I'm going to drive up here in my pickup truck, and I am going to make my life count for something. I am going to engage in political action. I am going to take a stand against Wall Street. And they came up here and they slept in tents. They came up here and, and they, it was pretty dirty up here sometimes. You know, it wasn't the most fun place to be. They, they slept on concrete. They slept in a sleeping bag and they said, I am going to take a stand for something. I am going to believe in something. I am going to sacrifice for something. I'm going to be part of a cause that is bigger than myself. I am going to believe in something. I'm going to sacrifice for something. I'm going to get arrested for something. I'm going to get maced for something. I'm going to get clubbed for something. And that's beautiful because yes. it's that kind of initiative, that willingness to make sacrifices, that willingness to go out and struggle, that's what's always changed the world. You know, as much as Occupy Wall Street started on this day 10 years ago, I would say Occupy Wall Street really didn't start 10 years ago. Occupy Wall Street had already started when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was marching through the streets of this country building a campaign against poverty. I would say that Occupy Wall Street started back in the 1930s when workers occupied their factories, demanding jobs and education and union rights. I'd say that Occupy Wall Street started back when the Wobblies and the IWW were taking to the streets and, and organizing the unemployed. I'd say that Occupy Wall Street, uh, you know, it, it got started when John Brown and the abolitionists occupied Amen. Harper's Ferry. I'd say that Occupy Wall Street, uh, you know, it had been going at the time that people were demonstrating for the rights of women and their right to vote. I'd say that Occupy Wall Street has been around for a very, very long time. You could say Occupy Wall Street, you can go back thousands of years. Some people say maybe the first Occupy Wall Street was when Jesus Christ drove the money changers out of the town. Yeah! Yeah! Occupy Wall Street. But Occupy Wall Street has always been around. It's part of the human spirit. It is part of the drive of human beings to sacrifice, to struggle, to build something better. To believe that they can lose the world better than it was when they came into it. To believe they can make a contribution. They can stand up to the powerful. They can sacrifice for the cause of right. Occupy Wall Street has always been around within the human spirit. And Occupy Wall Street is not dead. Occupy Wall Street is alive. Very, very alive. People are struggling. People are organizing. People are fighting back. People are resisting. They are refusing to accept the low-wage police state and the high-tech dark ages that Wall Street and Silicon Valley and London are trying to impose on the world. Humanity is rising. Humanity is resisting. And Occupy Wall Street is alive 10 years later. Thank you very much. If you look up at these buildings all around us, before these buildings were constructed, what did the people who built them have? They had a blueprint. They had a blueprint and a plan. And then they went to engineers, and they went to construction workers, and they constructed the building. Well, right now, Wall Street and the banker class, the people who actually run this country, they have a blueprint. And it's written in all of their Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman textbooks. Their blueprint is the destruction of the future of this generation. Their blueprint is the end of free public education. Their blueprint is the end of decent schools. Their blueprint is low wages. Their blueprint is massive unemployment. Their blueprint is massive home foreclosures. Their blueprint is massive destruction of the future and the end of the social programs that keep people alive. 
That's their blueprint, and they're mobilizing around it. They've got their, their Democrats and their Republicans mobilizing around it. And if we're going to resist their program, we have to learn from the generations in the past who've done it before. In the 1930s, not far from here in Union Square, there was a demonstration of 10,000 people. And they gathered, and their slogan was, fight or starve. And they gathered in Union Square by the hundreds of thousands. And when the police told them they couldn't march, they said no. And they said, this is our street, and we're going to m march. And you know, they had a banner at that march. And you know what the slogan that was on the front banner of that march back in 1932, you know what the slogan was? Remember it. Remember it. Take it with you. If you, if you, if you remember a phrase, remember it. The slogan was class against class. And that's what we're talking about. Class against class. Say it with me. Class against class. Class against class. It's not about Democrat versus Republican. It's not about a liberal program or a conservative program. It's about the banker program versus the people's program. That's what's going on. If we're going to resist, we need a blueprint of our own. We need to design our own blueprint, and we need to start implementing it in the streets. We need a program that says equal rights for immigrant workers. We need a program that says end police brutality. We need a program that says stop the cuts in food stamps. We need a program that says hands off our schools and universities. We need a program that includes health care for all, jobs for all, education for all. And we need to step back and think about the real possibility that there could be a time when people like us could actually own and operate the banks and the factories. And there would be no boss class or banker class running society. People like you and I could actually have a say and run society. That would require one thing very simply, and it would require us to abolish capitalism. The capitalist system is the ruthless evil system of the bankers, and I say if we're going to resist their program and their blueprint for destruction, we're going to have to abolish their system. So let's organize, let's be out there, and let's fight! Thank you!